Should we just turn our attention now to the elephant that isn't in the room? Uh, yeah. Captain Lost. What do you... Th I don't know. <laughs> I've been thinking. I don't know. Had to be a V8, so yeah. I thought it would be a Mercedes. He'll have gone like he did in Botswana, solid. Uh, I thought... Uh, I reckon he's gone for Range Rover. In fact, we couldn't have been more wrong. Have you been on a Top Gear special before? I've seen yes. you on them. You have. I've seen you there. Yes, yes, definitely was. Uh -huh. James, they're tough. Yeah. Some viewers don't know this, but Lotus does not have a good reputation for quality. Some say that this stands for lots of trouble, usually serious. Usually serious. The 1997 Lotus Elise GT1 is definitely a car. It looks like Elise on crack, which it definitely is, since it just had bits added on to a base Elise body, increasing its length and width. Since it was 1997, and the GT1 class required homologation, as in, if you wanted to compete with a car, you build a road legal version of it, and with the constantly evolving landscape, and their Esprit GT1 becoming more and more uncompetitive, with the likes of Porsche, Nissan, Toyota, among others, creating purpose-built race cars we're so fond of to this day, Lotus decided to bite the bullet and get on with creating a brand spanking new race car. Unlike the big boys, Lotus didn't take part in Group C, so they didn't have a spec chassis to just cut in half and lob it onto their existing road cars, like Porsche did the year prior with the 911 GT1, nor have the doubloons like Mercedes and others. Not like the lack of the latter has ever stopped them from being successful, relying on their founder's logic AZ Meg Castle and not fat, trademark, they decided to take their newest sports car, and add bits to it, hoping it will work. Once they stopped flinging feces at the wall, until enough of it stuck to satisfy the minimum weight limit, they ended up with the Elise GT1. Knowing they wouldn't sell the damn thing as a street car, they only made one to satisfy the overlords, and proceeded to stick it someplace deep in the recesses of hell, or Hethel, England. Figuring, that the Toyota derived four banger from the original Elise would not cut it, the engineers decided to dump the twin turbo 3.5 litre V8 from the Esprit, making around 542 horsepower, which turned out to be a grave mistake. Lucky for us, Gran Turismo 2 doesn't come with vehicle damage nor mechanical failures, which was what plagued the car's competitiveness in real life. Later, Lotus decided to run some 5.7 litre V8s from the Corvette, making around 607 horsepower, which they had their grubby little mitts on developing, when they were a part of General Motors, but that proved to be a gamble, which proved some success. That has made the cars able to actually finish some races, it didn't bring the results Lotus was hoping for, and the cars were shelved and sold off to privateers after their initial factory-backed season. With that little history lesson out of the way, let's get on with how good it actually is, or isn't. The power figures can be seen in-game, but in classic PD fashion, they're hidden. By that I mean, the car in the showroom is said to be rocking 542 horsepower, but once we get the bastard, it's rocking 607 horsepower, but the engine specifications still say, it's a 3.5 litre V8, presumably twin turbo. From my experience, the car suffers from the 25-30 FPS syndrome, where its handling characteristics become quite wild and unpredictable. I don't know the code behind it, but I believe it has to do something with how often the physics are updated. Let me show you. Take a look at this side-by-side -side comparison. On one side we have the game running in 25 FPS and on the other in 50 FPS. Cursed pal timing, please do note how the car suddenly gets a sudden, unexpected boost to what many experts over here in the old narrow gauge train depot which we use as our base of operations as the railway is gone, believe is front end grip, which allows the car to get around the turn at an incredible rate of speed, but being unpredictable and almost uncontrollable during the process. If you're playing on an emulator, please for the love of God, 
run the game at 50 slash 60 fps. If you want to drive this car and not suffer, but if you do like big vampire mamas stepping on you and big spider human girl hybrids tying you up in their bondage silk, I highly suggest mapping your controller as an Eekin, as it is the only somewhat reliable way to actually drive these cars in 25 slash 30 fps. The following tune is made with that in mind. From the testing done by myself, this is the best thing we could come up with, which allows to take advantage of the physics jank. Just don't expect to tackle the test course in this thing without turning on the FPS hack, because this car is not made from the ground up, like the road versions of the LMP racers, like the R390 and the GT1. It is just a wall with enough shit stuck on it, to constitute it an entry to the GT1 class. Now, after shitting on the coolest turd ever, I think it's time to dust off an old relic we've found laying around in the train depot's basement. Some say, he was responsible for hijacking a west coast plane back in the 70s, and that out of all things he'd like people to stop bringing up at the dinner table, is his craving for cats. All we know is, that he's called Steve. Right, Steve is revving up the car, and he's off. Pretty terrible start from Steve as the rear wheels spin away. Goes into the carousel at a remarkable 220 kph, even with that bad start, but slows right down, just in time to hang on to the inside of the corner, as he attempts to set up for the thumb, a bit wobbly going out of it, managing to keep the car under control as he speeds through the chicanes. Gets on the brake perfectly, going downhill into the barrel, past the barrel with flying colors, as he's picking up speed for the double apex run to the back straight for the final stint. Breaks just in time for the roundabout, and good lord, he just barely misses both walls, as he sets up for the final blast down the straight. A slight dink on the inside wall will hurt his time, but he manages to get the car cleanly onto the long start, finish straight and across the line in 1 colon 14.175, which is rather quick for a standing start. The car, when being ran in 50 slash 60 fps, is actually quite a treat to drive, given its notoriety for being very difficult to handle, akin to a wild Mustang, when used on original hardware, or when not running a speed act via an emulator. In any case, the car is definitely very competitive and very enjoyable. So if you're planning on replaying Gran Turismo 2 anytime soon, especially when there are mods being created by the brilliant community on the GT Planet forums, you should really consider trying this bad boy out. It may not have been successful in real life, but its virtual performance is nothing to scoff at. 